So here are two complicated terms that we get asked about all the time. Radiculopathy and myelopathy. What's the difference? Let's find out. Hey guys, Khaled here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. So radiculopathy and myelopathy. These are two pathologies or terms connected with the spinal column but they really do present differently. And so to understand the differences between the two is really crucial. Let's dive into everything with this video, starting with what are they? So first of all, I'm gonna give you a phrase that has helped me loads through the course of my career, and I'm sure it will help you remember these two terms as well. So the phrase is R equals R, M equals M. Let's go through what that means. So first of all, R equals R. A radiculopathy is a compression or an irritation to one of the nerve roots around the spine. This could be, for example, at the cervical spine or the lumbar spine. Now, when we refer to a nerve root, remember that there are both sensory and motor nerve roots at each level within the spinal column. Now, causes for a radiculopathy might be a herniated disc, which might be pushing against one of those nerve roots, or it could be that degenerative osteophytic changes might be happening around the spine where there's a bony growth that pushes onto one of those areas. Now, a myelopathy refers to a compression of the spinal cord within the spinal canal. And that means that we're compressing directly into the middle of that spinal canal where the spinal cord is. So potential causes for this might be a central herniated disc where it's pushing right through the middle, or unfortunately, we might get things like a metastatic spinal cord compression where we have a cancerous tumor in the middle of the spinal canal. Or we might also get stenosis, which is whereby we get narrowing of the area of the spinal canal due to degenerative changes. So therefore, what is R equals R and M equals M? Well, quite simply, R equals R, radiculopathy equals root. M equals M, myelopathy equals middle to help you remember that it's a compression of the middle of the spine where the spinal cord is. So there you go. Hope that helps you. So next we're going to dive into the key signs and symptoms that are different between a radiculopathy and a myelopathy. And of course this is super important because it will help us diagnose which one our patient might be presenting with. And for the purposes of making life easier we're going to focus on the cervical spine for the examples we're about to give you. So for example, if we were to talk about a cervical radiculopathy, let's pretend our patient has a disc herniation at the C7, C8 level of their cervical spine. What might this look like? Well, first of all, one of the key symptoms is arm pain. We know from this brilliant study from Kang, Lee and Lee that over 97% of patients are likely to present with arm pain when they have a cervical radiculopathy. So this may well present as a shooting or burning electrical type sensation that runs down and through the arm. Really irritable to patients. So arm pain is definitely one key symptom. Otherwise, let's think about nerve roots. As we said earlier, we have sensory nerve roots and we have motor nerve roots. Therefore, it makes sense that some of the key signs that the patient might present with might be sensory loss, therefore pins and needles or numbness in a particular area of the arm, or motor weakness where they don't have as much power on the affected side compared to the other side. And for example, if it was a C7, C8 disc herniation, we might expect the C7 myotome of elbow extension or the C8 myotome of thumb extension to be affected as a result. And then, of course, remember that the nerve roots are involved in the reflex arc when our patient has a reflex test. And therefore, we might expect our patient to have diminished reflexes or hyporeflexia when you do their reflex test. So C7, C8 reflex test is the triceps reflex test. So you might find that this is reduced on this side. So R equals R, radiculopathy equals root. Arm pain, potential sensory loss, potential motor loss, potential reflex changes. So next, myelopathy. Remember, M equals M, myelopathy equals middle. So this refers to a central compression of the spinal cord within the cervical spine. An example of where this might happen, as we said, might be something sinister like a metastatic spinal cord compression or a tumor within the spinal canal of the cervical spine. 
So what might this look like? Well, remember that with a myelopathy, you're compressing the spinal cord, but therefore all the levels below that level of the spinal cord might be affected. So here, with a cervical myelopathy, you might expect your patient to have upper limb symptoms, but they might also have lower limb symptoms too. So as well as pain in the arms, perhaps both arms because it's the central compression of the spinal cord, perhaps they might have reduced power in their hands, they might feel clumsy or they're dropping things. But also, as we said, it might be that the legs are affected too. So you might find your patient has leg pain, they might be clumsy on their feet, they might feel as if they're losing their balance or as if they're tripping at times. So do look out for that upper limb and lower limb change, which is definitely not what we would expect with a cervical radiculopathy. So next, what might we look for in our objective examination that might help us differentiate between these two issues? So if we start with a radiculopathy, well, we mentioned earlier, R equals R, radiculopathy equals root. And if we think of the key functions of the nerve root, we're thinking sensory changes, motor changes, or potential reflex changes. Therefore, it makes sense that with our examination, sensory, we're thinking dermatomal testing, Motor changes, we're thinking myotomal testing, and reflex changes, we're going to do our reflex tests. Now, of course, think about the spinal level that might be involved. We talked earlier about a C7, C8 cervical radiculopathy, and therefore, we might specifically try and focus on the C7, C8 dermatomes, the C7, C8 myotomes, and the C7, C8 reflex test, which is the triceps reflex. But of course, we're going to go through all the testing and specifically look to see if that spinal level is different to the others. So then myelopathy, M equals M, myelopathy equals middle. And if we're thinking about that middle central spinal cord compression, we're actually dealing with an upper motor neuron lesion. So when we're testing for upper motor neuron lesions, we still need to do our dermatomes, our myotomes, our reflex tests. But specifically, we might also think of our upper motor neuron reflex tests. So the key three ones that come to mind in my practice are Babinski's test, Kloner's test and Hoffman's test. So Babinski's test, this is where we're lying the patient supine, we've got the back of the reflex hammer and we're scraping up the lateral border of the foot to see if it causes a fanning of the toes, which would be a positive sign. We'll do Kloner's test, which is where we passively move the ankle and then quickly apply a jerk into ankle dorsiflexion. And what we're looking for there is four or more rhythmical contractions of the foot into plantar flexion as a positive result. And then Hoffman's test, this is where we hold at the distal interphalangeal joint of the middle finger, and as the examiner, we're just flicking the end of the finger. What happens with a positive result is that the thumb and the index finger of the same hand being tested move towards each other like so. That would be a positive test there. And if those are positive, again, we're suspecting an upper motor neuron lesion, which could be a central spinal cord compression. Now, if you wanted more on cervical myelopathy testing, make sure you look at Cook's cluster. This can easily be found on Google and is absolutely brilliant for highlighting the key signs that commonly score when you're looking at your cervical myelopathy testing, in particular, degenerative cervical myelopathy testing. So the key five signs that Cook's cluster looks at include age above 45, a positive Hoffman's test, a positive Babinski's test, Gait disturbance, as we said, because the lower limb could be affected as well, and a positive inverted supinator sign. And therefore, do test those if you're particularly thinking about the potential for a cervical myelopathy of a degenerative nature. Now, guys, if you wanted more on this kind of stuff, we've got some absolutely brilliant webinars that will really help you. We've got things like musculoskeletal red flags, lumbar spine red flags, cervical spine red flags. And these webinars absolutely go into all of this in more detail. If you want to check those out, link in the description below for Clinical Physio Premium Membership, where you can watch all of those. Otherwise, if you've enjoyed this video, we'd be super grateful if you can smash that like button and remember to follow and subscribe us for more updates. Remember, we've got our Instagram account at Clinical Physio and even more resources on our website, clinicalphysio.com. I'm Khalid. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.